So, uh, okay, uh, now I will start uh, a special lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Nordic Banner Center special lecture. I'm Director Jason Lee of Nordic Banner Center and Dean of Graduate School, School of International Studies at Korea University. Uh, first of all, I congratulate uh, this very special lecture co-organized with the Embassy of Belgium and the Benelux Union. My special thank goes to Ambassador Peter Lesqui and Director Jan Molema of the Benelux Union. Nordic Benelux Innovation Factory is a, is a seminar series of, of Nordic Benelux Center to invite expert diplomats entrepreneur and other leaders in order to build a bridge between uh, Nordic and Benelux countries and Korea. And so today I'm privileged to have a uh, director Jan Malama of the Benelux Union in our innovation factory. Director Malama is a trained lawyer and, and linguist and he studied his career at the European Commission and European Parliament. Then he, uh, he built his business career at IKEA, a, a well-known global company. And he returned to the government administration uh, by joining the Benelux Union and has directed the internal market and economy department. Today's topic is uh, the role of regional cooperation in energy and climate policy. And I think it's, it's a very pertinent issue to connect the Benelux country and Korea. Nowadays, a series of initiatives of carbon neutrality, uh, renewable energies, and sustainable developments are becoming core agenda of global and also Korea-Europe cooperation. And these issues certainly need a regional and multilateral framework for an effective implementation. So I hope uh, today's lecture uh, will shed light on the future energy collaboration between Europe, Benelux in particular, and Korea. And without further ado, uh, let me invite uh, Director Malema to the online podium. Uh, Director Malema, thank you, thank you very much for joining in this special lecture. Now, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's a, it's a pleasure to have such a nice introduction. Uh, 8,700 kilometers apart. I just double checked on my Google Maps. Um, and it's uh, e even more important to see that uh, so many people gather for a, a meeting like, like this. Uh, we just uh, briefly discussed uh, the, the history of the Nordic Benelux Center. It's fairly young still. So it's important that there is uh, action going on, that there is um, input coming from both sides. And today I hope to share with you a little bit uh, of the knowledge being built up within the Benelux on uh, energy and climate cooperation. I, I will start reading a li little bit of a text uh, in, in the beginning and then um, start up a, um, a PowerPoint to give it uh, two layers. Um, but the, the, the beginning of the text, I, I think, is important uh, from my side. But let me also uh, thank and congratulate the Belgian and the Korean um, uh, officials on the 120 years of uh, relationship being celebrated this year. Um, the Benelux Union being presided also this year by Belgium um, uh, makes this whole, whole story, I think, complete uh, and underpins the good relations that is uh, already existing between our countries and in our cooperation in many, many fields. In essence, as it stands today, climate and energy policy is ultimately a national responsibility in European countries. It's entrenched, nevertheless, in a regional reality and in need of a pathway to reach its European EU destination. Therefore, successful regional cooperation, such as the Benelux, can be a trailblazer. And that's what I hope to share with you today. Uh, in the last 10 years, the European level has become predominant in climate and energy the discussions and the Energy Union project seeks to further integrate the internal market to develop a more common approach to security of supply and create genuine solidarity, an important 
uh, statement these days, I think. A multinational regional level has emerged as a bridge between the national level that still holds many competences in this area and the end European level. The regional cooperation is now recognized as the stepping stone needed to deliver the energy union and to make sure that EU-wide climate and energy targets are achieved. Um, the articulation of the roles of the European regional and national levels represents a major challenge of governance, you can understand that. It requires an in-depth dialogue to develop appropriate solutions to the numerous problems facing a fast-changing energy sector with all the renewables being put into the market today and all the um, fossil fuels being needed to be phased out. This um, uh, presentation will propose that regional cooperation cannot be approached with a top-down, one-size-fits-all mindset. Rather, flexibility is essential to ensure successful cooperation that is effective and not burdensome for the parties involved. At the same time, a clear framework can stimulate regional initiatives to fulfill their enormous potential and mitigate possible risks involved. Therefore, a toolbox box like the Benelux is can reconcile these two conflicting realities. It implies flexibility as well as predictability and continuity. Having a range of well-defined tools available enables regions to create tailor-made solutions while simultaneously streamlining the current proliferation of regional cooperation. Now, for the sake of tools, I will set up the uh, share my screen with the PowerPoint. So one brief moment for this. Mr. Chang, if you can uh, indicate, if you can see what I'm sharing right now. Is it visible? Yes, okay. So Benelux Energy and Climate Cooperation. I will be a little bit freer from the paper as from now. Uh, I'd like always to start with a picture for, taken from space. Here you see a picture, picture taken from space from the European Union by night, and it shows many things. It shows there's a lot of lights. It shows that um, the countries of the Benelux within the European Union are well visible, um, uh, not only during night, by the way. Um, but it also makes clear that uh, if we want to um, create a new energy system that is climate proof, these, this area within the European Union needs to play a leading role and needs to cooperate closely to um, uh, make agreements and to make it work. Um, a brief outline of what I will try to tell in this, uh, in this, uh, sec uh, in this uh, meeting today. First of all, a little step back, the historical and organizational context of the Benelux Union. I don't know how well informed all of your students are, but I think it is always good to know where we come from, where historically we come from, and how the Benelux works. Um, I already mentioned quite often the words and the concept of regional cooperation. The Benelux and the Benelux office, the Benelux house, as we like to call it, is the home of regional cooperation on energy in the European Union. So we will get lots of examples of that in uh, during this um, lecture. And of course, um, going sl slowly from energy cooperation to climate cooperation, which is predominant these days and which basically is to be seen as one, building climate cooperation on the existing energy regional cooperation that is already uh, well established in the Benelux house. So where did we start as a Benelux Union? The Benelux was founding father, founding fathers of the European Union in 1958. More than that, it was already, uh, the concept was already um, launched during the end of the Second World War. Um, as a small story behind all this, it was in the Savoy Hotel in uh, London, um, where the ministers of foreign affairs, after having met during a, a soccer match uh, during the weekend said, if we want to come uh, stronger out of this uh, horrible war, we should cooperate immediately um, uh, and starting with a customs union. And this customs union was established uh, already uh, 44 and lasted until 48. And in this sense, one of the oldest uh, international corporations um, existing. In 58, parallel 
uh, notably parallel to the uh, establishment of the European Union, the Benelux Economic Union was established. Uh, this was a very conscious decision because, of course, the three countries could have said, okay, we have now got the European Union together with Germany, France, and Italy at the time, so um, we can outface the Benelux Union, but they were very pertinent in keeping up the uh, already gathered um, uh, benefits of the then created and established internal market that functioned well and was very needed between the Benelux countries themselves. Um, so they really insisted on this and they also had this anchored in the official launching treaties of the European Union, the treaties of Rome, of which you can see some nice black and white pictures in the background. Um, by the way, the presentation will be shared after this meeting so you can take a closer look uh, after this uh, event maybe. Um, I think most of the people uh, that have studied a little bit the Benelux Corporation know um, the, the, about the Schengen Agreements. Before Europe in 85 uh, launched the Schengen Agreement, uh, Schengen, by the way, a small village in uh, the country of Luxembourg, that's what it's named after, uh, the Benelux countries already in the 60s uh, opened their borders to visa-free traveling because of the already developed trust within the economic cooperation, vis-a-vis -vis travel was sort of a, a pioneering, a laboratory project within the Benelux Union. Um, and in 85, especially Germany and France said, we would really like to join this. We would like to create a opener and greater free space of uh, people traveling across borders and uh, based on goods agreements and trust also opened uh, the space of vis-a-vis -vis free travel. Um, then I make a big leap because I don't think we have to uh, do every step until uh, since then. But in 2008, because the treaty was quite modern actually when it was launched in 58, it was uh, had an evaluation clause after 50 years, it should be evaluated whether the Benelux Union still had a, a sense to, to, to further exist. And the conclusion was clearly yes, even though the European Union had grown and um, uh, taken large parts of the uh, internal market functioning, but still the role for the Benelux Union with its specific transport needs as a gateway to Europe, um, as a um, uh, close cooperation on, uh, in the field also in, uh, in, in justice and security, there was a strong need to uh, keep the Benelux as a, a free country player uh, nevertheless. So in 2008, a treaty was signed by, uh, the, as you can see on the color picture there, uh, by the three prime ministers at the time. And uh, at the, uh, in 2012, this was coming into effect. The Benelux, uh, what, how big is it or how small is it? You saw a picture from above before. It's, uh, you could well see it, but it's in surface, of course, not that big. It's only approximately 2% of the total European uh, land surface. Uh, Population-wise, you can already see uh, it's quite densely populated. It's 6% um, uh, of the European population. This, these figures, by the way, are pre-Brexit. It's a little bit more these days, I think. Um, even though percentage-wise, uh, this, this change doesn't change a lot. And uh, for um, uh, the GDP, uh, we are more than uh, adding more than 8% to the total European uh, GDP, which is also uh, over uh, pro proportional compared to the surface of the country. And it shows, say, the ec economic importance um, and the interlinkedness I liked to add uh, a small uh, figure on universities. It's a very dense university landscape with many old cities with old universities. Uh, by the way, one of which um, I, I studied myself in the north of the Netherlands, so Groningen also joins today, I hope, for this, uh, for this session. Um, uh, but there's many uh, cities in the, in, in the Benelux countries that host universities of uh, all kinds. Uh, and three of them in the meantime are in uh, right now are in the top 100 ranking. I think just two or three of them fall, off, fall out over the pandemic year for, for whatever reasons, but um, uh, there's quite a few of them just after this uh, one number 100 position. So it's, a, it's an interesting, I think, area for you also to exchange with uh, on an academic level. Um, then continuing with um, the cooperation of the Benelux. Very important to mention, um, whereas the European Union is a supranational uh, institution, meaning that the countries can take majority decisions, 
uh, the Benelux is an uh, intergovernmental uh, organization, um, meaning that whatever they do, uh, whatever they decide, it needs to be done in unanimity. Um, and uh, this is important to know. It also means that we are not active on all fields. We uh, have a very clear um, and uh, yeah, marked number of topics on which we worked. Work. The first one I already mentioned a few times, the internal markets and the economy, um, uh, where uh, the, the main topics within are transport, energy, uh, retail, and uh, labor mobility. Then, uh, since basically the new treaty, sustainable development, of course, uh, so 2008, 2012, is a topic which cannot be off uh, any uh, agendas, but it's a very horizontal topic. So it also returns actually in the, all these internal market developments. And um, the, the third uh, main pillar of the Benelux Corporation is justice and home affairs. Um, <coughs> pardon. <coughs> Um, where um, uh, justice and home affairs, uh, the cooperation between the police um, uh, organizations, for instance, is very much closer than many other countries can do cross-border. We have treaties, we have police uh, agreements that allow, uh, for instance, the um, uh, uh, pursuits of criminals across borders. So you cannot escape going across an internal Benelux border. Uh, police can keep on uh, tracing that, but also ambulances in the case of uh, health uh, problems. Uh, it will, if you call an ambulance in a, uh, in a border area in the Benelux, you will not get the uh, official closest by in your country. You will get the closest by in the Benelux area, just regardless in which um, uh, country you are. So in that sense, the Benelux even saves lives, you can maybe uh, state. Um, so what are, on these three topics, our main objectives? It's, first of all, logically, cross-border cooperation, uh, where possible. If I have to explain to my children, what do you actually do at work, Dad? Uh, I often say, why don't you draw a map and you put some borders on the Benelux, and where you find a problem, you take um, uh, a piece to erase, basically, the border again. That's what we do. Where there is a problem, we try to lift the border problems by uh, ad hoc and tailor-made solutions, um, often solving also niches. And the second role is very much linked to our relationship to Europe, to the, the launching of the, the Benelux Corporation. And that's being a pioneer, be it, being the living lab for Europe, often in a regulatory sense, uh, because we have uh, a special relationship to, uh, to Europe, but also often in just taking a step a little bit earlier in developing internal market uh, solutions. Um, and we, I will come back on that. Um, institutional wise and uh, instruments. Uh, you can compare the Benelux a little bit to uh, the European Union or a little bit quite, uh, quite substantially. We have uh, five institutions, um, a court of justice on one hand to, uh, to check legally uh, ultimate things. Um, I myself am employed by the General Secretariat, which uh, you can compare to the European Commission. It's the, uh, if I may modestly say, the engine of the Benelux Corporation, uh, the, the annual program for um, uh, activities is being uh, prepared in the General Secretariat, being put forward to the, first of all, the council, uh, which involves the the functionaries, the leading functionaries of the ministries of uh, foreign affairs that then have a look at it and finally put it forward to the committee of ministers, which are the ministers of foreign affairs of the three countries that uh, approve of this working plan, this annual plan, and um, their way, their way f give a mandate for the Benelux countries, uh, Benelux uh, institutions to work on those issues. You can download all those um, uh, documents, by the way, on uh, benelux.int. Uh, the, the website will also be by the end of the presentation. And there's also um, important to mention a Benelux Parliamentarian Assembly or the Benelux Parliament uh, in, in brief, uh, which uh, has uh, three meetings a year uh, and uh, basically follows from an actuality point of view um, the, the topics within the Benelux and brings together, brings together 49 uh, members of parliaments selected from the different national and regional parliaments. One important thing I um, forgot to mention actually in uh, the, the first uh, two slides is that uh, since the new treaty 
also the regions of Belgium, due to the, the changes in the Belgian uh, state organization, now have an official um, a role to play within the Benelux organization. In light blue, you see um, uh, an institution that is not uh, officially linked to uh, the Benelux Union, but it's an important part of it nevertheless. It's the Intellectual Property Office. It's actually the example of the perfect internal market existing within the Benelux um, uh, that uh, actually allows for people that, uh, for companies that have a brand or a model to be protected within the Benelux market um, to uh, issue it no matter where in the Benelux and be it protected throughout the, the Benelux region and thereby often a stepping stone for Euro European protection. How do we then actually uh, create uh, decisions? How do we uh, what is our what is the products we deliver if I put it in a let's say private uh, context um, we uh, we make uh, paper decisions so uh, on one hand we um, uh, try to bring in motion uh, political intentions therefore we use the the recommendations um, um, the, the balance ministers the balance state secretaries they sign uh, an official um, uh, Benelux recommendation and thereby say, okay, we would like to be, uh, uh, we would like to coordinate as much as possible, for instance, uh, on um, creating a um, uh, sustainable transport and mobility system. Uh, this has been done, for instance, in 2015 on uh, sustainable mobility. And in the meantime, we're making now decisions. That's a second layer which we can use where we can take concrete and legally binding decisions um, um, and make basically a Benelux law on how we do this. So for instance, this year we will launch a registration office for electrical charging points, um, which is extremely actual and extremely needed for uh, a proper legal framework for the, yeah, the, the big wave of electric mobility coming towards us. You see slowly but steadily we are approaching the topic of um, uh, sustainable energy and um, uh, climate and energy cooperation. Um, if we have something which is even more, let's say, um, impacting, we also can use uh, conventions or treaties. Uh, they are not often uh, so often employed because they take a little bit more pliant, uh, time. Uh, but uh, and the, the, the advantage of decisions in that case, which are legally binding, is that they can take and be decided quite quickly, actually, within a year from idea to end decision, you can have a Benelux decision um, uh, being carried out. And then the fourth one, the directive, it's quite seldomly used is when there's a new topic uh, and uh, the, the government actually wants us to start up, they can give internal directives for us to start working on this. So um, I come slowly but steadily closer to the, the, the main part of the, the story. I mentioned it already, we have a Belgian presidency, so once again, this fits very much uh, in, in your 120 years uh, Korea-Belgium relation and celebration. They have gave, given us this year four uh, free um, uh, uh, priorities and motto uh, to, uh, to, to work on there. One very clear motto, and by the way, very much very close to our hearts in any scenario, is that reinforcing the relation to the EU, this I think cannot be seem completely free from um, the new situation in which Europe has been put by uh, the UK leaving um, the European Union. Uh, the Benelux countries are found not only founding fathers, but still strong um, uh, supporters of the European uh, thoughts. And, and we do this this year by strengthening the internal market with a focus on the retail and digitalization. Digitalization is, of course, on any agenda, strengthening sustainability, there a strong focus on economy, energy and mobility. The last two are hardly separable anymore. And uh, of course, also very important, strengthening security cooperation, uh, where cross-border crime and radicalization are real issues that, uh, that need, to, need to be addressed. Um, I often uh, tell something about the so-called best kept secrets uh, of the Benelux. You could also call it cutting edge. Many people also within the Benelux uh, have forgotten that we have got uh, a very special position. You see the big of Europe and the small Benelux uh, internal market. But because we have this special clause, Article 350 of the functioning treaty of the EU, uh, we can go further and faster in um, uh, creating our internal market. 
uh, this is very special if you uh, live in a European context because Europe, the European internal market was based and designed to do things at the same pace. And that has its sense because you don't want people to be left behind. But at the same time, it's nice to have a living lab uh, where you can um, uh, test things out. And because of the fact that the, the, the Bedlux had this historical uh, leader role and had this clause in the, um, EO, in the founding treaties um, uh, anchored, uh, we can still be this test bed based on this um, uh, clause in the, in, the, in the functioning treaty of the of the European Union, and um, especially in the field of transport, where we have a lot of innovation going on, and where we need to be ahead of, uh, let's say, the the market a little bit to uh, to also have the right legislation in place. We have been uh, creating quite a, quite a few uh, solutions based on the on this clause. For instance, longer and more clean. Um, uh, trucks and transport already can go cross-border within uh, the Benelux, whereas in uh, Europe it still has to be negotiated. Uh, but there we then share the knowledge of the Benelux decisions uh, to, um, to the European Union so that later on this can be um, a, a jumping board for the European Union. So here we are in 2021. We have recently a new multi-annual program where um, we are working strongly towards a, a strong and sustainable Benelux internal markets, contributing, of course, to a digital and green recovery. Green recovery is one of the key words um, uh, well, during and post-pandemic uh, in the European Union. Um, uh, there's uh, enormous funding being pulled together, and the main lines uh, of uh, qualification for, for getting these fundings for uh, investors is that it needs to be focusing on digital, it needs to be focusing on green, and it must be fo focusing also on keeping it just, making it a just transition. Um, <clears throat> then if you look at um, our national or our yearly plan, because on top of the, the, the four-year plan, of course, every year we make a annual plan linked to the, the topics we sp speak today, um, we have a number of uh, events uh, on the uh, agenda, uh, for instance, on hydrogen infrastructure. I don't know if you are, if this is a big topic in Korea. I, I actually, I do know uh, you also are investing uh, big time in wind energy and you also need to uh, create uh, fossil fuels outfacing and uh, replacing uh, energy. Hydrogen is a very big topic. We will uh, do uh, uh, many discussions on this. Uh, an energy and innovation day. We have a, a PENTA research agenda. PENTA is a brief for uh, cooperation with the, the surrounding countries, Germany, France, um, Switzerland, and Austria. And um, uh, we also will work intensively on e-mobility, um, uh, which um, I just mentioned with the establishment of uh, the registration of our office for charging operators. So uh, this as for agenda points. Benelux the home of regional energy cooperation. Um, this is, um, I think, um, the basis of um, uh, many, many energy corporations within uh, the, the, the European Union. And I hope I can uh, share with you some, uh, some uh, thoughts and uh, uh, say the success factors of cooperation, of regional cooperation in this field, specifically on energy and, um, and climate that can also apply in, in your region. Um, to start off with, because uh, I've explained, we are linked to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We have uh, as an organization, we bring together the ministries, the functionaries from these ministries on a daily basis in working group meetings, but also at the upper, upper top of the, uh, the Benelux hierarchy, the, the prime ministers meet every year um, uh, in a very friendly and um, convivial way and declare what their intentions are. And last year, uh, despite the pandemic, they have met and uh, have underlined actually their um, uh, strong um, uh, focus on, uh, on, on energy and, and climate cooperation. And I will read uh, out the, uh, I will not read out the complete text here, but here you see how they emphasize the, the close cooperation within the Benelux countries, linking into the regional platforms that are surrounding us uh, with the neighbors, but also on the North Sea, which is a, a very big potential area for um, for, for uh, renewable energy, and um, with a very strong focus on um, on the future of hydrogen infrastructure and international offshore energy 
uh, on the North Sea. And of course, in the end, also leading to an um, infrastructure for zero emission transport because we are a very, very transport intensive um, uh, region. Um, three, uh, four platforms uh, I would like to um, uh, light out of, the, uh, of this uh, number of corporations we host. By the way, if there are any questions in between, feel free to raise hands or um, maybe put them in the in the chat. I have asked Mr. Chung and uh, his colleague Mrs. Li to uh, for, see if there is any questions coming in, and we can uh, take anyway take them by the end. But here are the uh, the, the four um, main platforms: the, the pentalateral energy forum, uh, the gas platform, um, which I will briefly uh, speak out about now. The gas platform is the uh, Benelux countries with Germany and France exchanging um, views on um, the, the gas infrastructure and up till recent or up till now actually also the the production of gas in the north of the Netherlands being um, spread out over the area of uh, these five countries but this is being uh, faded out because the production there now stops uh, slowly but, uh, but steadily um, due to earthquakes in that region due to uh, the, the, the gas extraction. Uh, so the focus is much more on renewable energy in the other platforms and therefore you also have the North Seas Energy Corporation and I would like to start with uh, the Benelux um, uh, Energy Expertise Network which you slowly can see uh, some um, uh, logos popping up right now. Uh, some five years ago we um, decided that with having all the, the platforms hosted in our um, uh, Benelux uh, house, it was also time to reinforce the, the connection to um, the sector, and especially to the knowledge institutions in, uh, in the Benelux. So we basically made a tour the Benelux to ask for uh, people interested and connected uh, with uh, wholeheartedly to the uh, energy transition. And these institutions, and this is not a list that uh, doesn't evolve every year, there's uh, a number of them leaving or merging and new ones coming in, but uh, here you see a, a nice mix of, of universities actually, uh, but also of uh, purpose uh, vehicles that focus on one um, uh, fuel, for instance, on, on hydrogen uh, or on offshore wind uh, throughout the Benelux. We um, uh, try to bring them together on a regular basis, but most of all, we try to be a platform where they can use uh, in normal situations, also the, the, the in fiscal terms, our offices to organize events around energy transition topics. Uh, if the um, uh, policy makers of the Benelux, the director generals, for instance, of the ministries of energy need feedback from the Benelux sector on a certain topic, they can ask this network for input, uh, and uh, for instance, we have um, in, in the past also organized um, uh, several events on the premises of the embassies in the, in the countries where these kind of uh, events were being uh, being organized. And um, uh, this, uh, where uh, one second, I have to interrupt for a brief uh, door going out. Um, I excuse for this. Um, this um, having, having said this, the uh, organization on this list uh, have actually also led to the fact that we are here today because um, uh, throughout the embassies the, uh, the word has spread and I think uh, your uh, ambassador in, in, in Seoul uh, of uh, the Embassy of Belgium has also gotten to know about the Benelux Corporation in this field through the Baynex uh, expertise network. And to this year, uh, we uh, hope to organize uh, an event on energy innovation uh, together with uh, the network of, uh, of Baynex. Um, then the Pentalateral Energy Forum. Um, this is actually a quite a famous platform within the European Union and uh, has uh, over the last 15 years shown its, uh, its uh, added value in, in trying to bring together um, not only ministries, not only experts from the ministries in uh, the field of energy, but also the regulators um, and also the, uh, when necessary, the, the network companies, the TSOs. Um, and um, this mix, 
was quite new, uh, new, new in uh, let's say some some 10, 15 years ago, um, but has proven to be very uh, valuable in creating a, a true internal market between the, the beginning five and later on uh, Austria and uh, Switzerland joined, then the seven countries. Um, so these, um, um, this is called cooperation um, being well noticed, preparing points of view on European cooperation, preparing a, um, let's say, uh, good studies to underpin new directions in um, uh, exchange of uh, energy over, over borders and converging finally the markets uh, much more than they were before. Um, has led to um, to actually uh, quite a number of um, uh, uh, decisive changes in, in EU energy policy. Um, this um, uh, pentilateral energy forum has um, uh, no official um, formalities that, um, that that founded it apart from an, a statement by the, by the by the ministries. It's in that sense quite lean and informal. Uh, but at the same time, it has been uh, put at the Benelux Secretariat to be hosted there and to, um, uh, in, the, in that sense, we, we assure continuity, we assure that the regional um, drive stays there and having quite a you know, let's say substantial number, uh, more than 40% of the production and, and output of uh, energy in the, in the European Union is being done in the ben Benelux, Germany, France, um, uh, Austria and, and Switzerland. Uh, if the, a good decision is taken, the impact, the, let's say the, the living lab is uh, so substantial that it is a very uh, useful uh, add-on to, uh, not only add-on, but a very, very useful building material for the European Union to take further decisions in the energy markets. Main topics have been in the past years, the security of supply, uh, and right now the system integration, and of course, uh, slowly but steadily working towards the, um, uh, the climate targets as set by the, the Paris agreements. So um, if you are looking for where does Penta, uh, Penta Lateral Energy uh, Cooperation take place, where do people come together? It's at the Benelux Secretariat, even in the digital context, we keep on hosting this. Um, and uh, there's a, a nice uh, advantage of uh, the Benelux hosting this, and that is that the, 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 the chairmanship actually of this grouping is following the Benelux uh, chairmanship. So this year, Belgium, the minister of Belgium, Mrs. Tine van der Straten, she is um, leading the ministerial meetings of uh, the Pentilateral Cooperation. Um, the North Sea, uh, some people call this the green powerhouse of, um, uh, of, the, of the European Union, or at least of the Northwest European Union. Um, with all the fossil fuels and partially also nuclear fuels being phased out in, uh, in, in the Benelux and surrounding uh, countries, uh, there needs to be an alternative. And uh, quite some years ago already, uh, out of the Penta Corporation, the Benelux, especially, especially uh, of course, the two, two ones on the coast, uh, Belgium and uh, Netherlands, said, okay, but should we not explore how we could well design uh, a... a cooperation on North Sea wind energy in the future, because wind energy was then still very expensive, still uh, very far from being innovative. It was more being tested than really being exploited yet. Um, but the main question at, at, at that time was, uh, how shall we create a network? Shall we, like we have done in the past, for each country, make uh, an electricity uh, line to a, a wind park and lead the energy back to just that country? Or would we like to make a network on the North Sea where we can integrate it and where we can maybe benefit from uh, you know, different uh, wind uh, power and different wind uh, force uh, at different times with different weather uh, and also different demands and thereby being able to um, uh, create actually uh, an exchange between all those countries. Uh, lots of studies took place because creating lines costs a lot of money, uh, but at the same time, uh, having too much power and not being able to stock it also costs uh, enormous investments. And the end conclusion after a number of years was, okay, it is really pays off to work together uh, and to create a so-called meshed grid. Um, uh, lots of drawings were being made um, until the moment where uh, basically the, 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 the energy transition became much more urgent and climate change became much more urgent. 
um, and uh, where lots of uh, doubts in the beginning years was still casted around, okay, will offshore wind ever be uh, uh, a efficient energy provider? Um, with, uh, the, I remember well, the, uh, the target being set by certain politicians say, okay, if you can innovate and optimize the efficiency of offshore winds by 40%, then you will get a substantial investment of a number of uh, billions from the governments. And actually, since then, the, the, the wheel started spinning literally very fast um, by doing um, also uh, innovative ways of tendering, uh, trying to bring down costs, trying to increase um, the uh, the, the, the numbers of, um, of, the, of the, the mills being put into the fields uh, and thereby uh, yeah, optimizing in an enormous tempo, enormous pace, um, the efficiency of these uh, windmills and wind parks. And right now there is, uh, you, you can say, a real boom in developing wind parks in the, in the, um, uh, in the North Sea. And it is actually being looked at as being one of the main suppliers of green energy to, of the future for for Europe. So it's a massive responsibility. Uh, it's 10 countries around the coast that work now together on, on it. And it's, it's it's a very complex issue. It's it's about maritime spatial planning. It's about support schemes and financing of between countries that need to be adapted somehow. Standardization, it's about creating basically rules on the North Sea that has never uh, existed before. Uh, <clears throat> but as we have this, um, uh, uh, experience already in uh, facilitating uh, energy cooperation. Also this, together with the European Union, is, um, has found a good place at uh, the Benelux House. So here you have another picture. I, I will leave that maybe a little bit for studying afterwards, but uh, you see the enormous potential and the role that it basically can play within the famous Green Deal that um, that Europe has uh, made now its its target to make um, and by, for which by the way yesterday a, a climate law by the European Parliament and the European um, Council was agreed uh, in which they say we will um, uh, actually uh, go for fifty five percent reduction of CO two by two thousand and thirty already and two thousand fifty then should be more or less climate neutral. Uh, and for that, you need enormous investments and the North Sea will play a massive role in this. Uh, in a very um, concrete way, uh, what is done um, uh, already, there are wind connectors being created between um, uh, Belgium and the UK, between uh, the Dan Danish and uh, uh, the Dutch. Uh, so there's three building and investing going on on the North Sea right now. All the ports uh, are uh, uh, you know, playing their role in facilitating construction of offshore wind parks on the sea, uh, meaning a massive uh, yeah, turnaround in, uh, um, in, uh, in in the way they actually operate their harbors. Uh, it's it's a booming business, and I think I think uh, having spoken to some of the <clears throat> um, let's say the wind associations from Belgium and from the Netherlands. Uh, there's already quite some exchange been between Korea and uh, Belgium. There's been trade missions trying to explain how uh, the, the knowledge that is being developed right now on the North Sea can, for instance, be shared on your offshore wind projects um, um, in, in Korea as well. So um, then the almost uh, holy or magic word of uh, energy cooperation today, hydrogen. And uh, to make it a little bit less hyd uh, magic, uh, and, and holy than, than it uh, is made sound. I always like to show one um, simple piece of pipe. Uh, hydrogen is about um, uh, not only about energy, it's also about transporting energy. Hydrogen, uh, if I compare it to a very old Dutch system of, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, conservation, it's just the same as how you uh, store milk in making it cheese. Yeah? We've done it in the Netherlands for many, many times, many, many years, and um, uh, it's a conversion, and, uh, and you can use it and reuse it. Uh, and the, uh, the hydrogen as such can be developed by wind energy, it can be developed by sun energy, uh, but the only problem is that you, if you use it uh, with green renewable uh, sources, 
uh, you cannot only you, you cannot only uh, or you cannot easily store uh, electricity in large chunks, uh, not, neither from sun nor, nor from wind. And with that, hydrogen could play a very important role because once it has been turned into hydrogen, you can store it in liquid form, you can store it in gas form, you can transport it also in uh, uh, through these uh, famous uh, pipelines. Um, and so in the end, we are talking a lot about how can we create uh, or maybe repurpose the existing uh, gas networks, which we have uh, from, the, from the natural gas we have dug, dug up from over many, many years. Um, how can we repurpose this in a way that all this um, uh, renewable energy that is being um, um, created on a nice windy and sunny, sunny day uh, in such a way that we have uh, in a constant way enough energy for the future, replacing the enormous numbers of still fossil fuels uh, being used today. How do we do this? Uh, you see a, a slide with many pictures. <laughs> Uh, on one hand, left hand, it's the Benelux director generals. They uh, they meet quite often um, simply to, to see, okay, where do we stand? And what can we agree already in the Benelux that can inspire our uh, countries uh, neighboring us? Uh, in 2018, they signed together a, a declaration on, on hydrogen. Um, but of course, they like to share this with the pentilateral um, uh, colleagues. So they're, the ministers in the end uh, met up uh, and uh, took, uh, took, uh, took a next step. Also, the Benelux Parliament uh, was involved uh, with a re recommendation. And on the right side, you see um, uh, probably something the most tangible you, you can, can see about hydrogen cooperation these days. It's the first uh, hydrogen uh, gas stations being planned throughout the Benelux, funded, by the way, by the European Union, uh, because it is a Benelux cross-border project. Um, and there's now eight uh, stations being uh, built. The, the first ones are opened around Amsterdam now, uh, going all the way from the uh, north of uh, the Netherlands to, uh, to, 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 to Luxembourg in the end. So people can start also buying cars because it's a chicken and egg problem. Huh? If you want to drive on hydrogen and there's no gas station, you don't buy a car and vice versa. If there's no cars, why would you build a gas station? So this is being pushed by the, the free governments. This is being uh, supported by uh, the European Union. Uh, to, uh, to come to a more uh, sustainable transport on hydrogen. Uh, and last uh, May 2020, uh, a very important declaration uh, on, uh, on hydrogen by the Pentilateral Energy Forum was negotiated and put forward basically just in time to um, give a, a very decisive input on the European Green Deal on hydrogen and the hydrogen infrastructure for the future. Um, so coming from there, with all this energy um, experience, uh, the climate cooperation uh, 2017, 2018, basically knocked on the, on the, on the political doors. Um, and uh, we um, uh, thought, okay, sh shall we start with something separately or shall we try to integrate it? And of course, uh, it makes sense to, to, to link it because one is um, uh, intrinsically linked to the other. Um, you, most of you will know about uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, where the first, uh, let's say, uh, real decisive steps were taken towards um, uh, getting our globe not to uh, uh, warm up more than one and a half to two degrees. Um, and uh, a process after that uh, to, to reach that, actually to give it, uh, let's say, the, the hands and feet on how to not uh, heat up the, the planet uh, even more is called the Telenoa process. And uh, the, the three countries, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, decided that they would like to make a statement together, very logically, because if you don't organize yourself well in uh, climate policy in a small country uh, like the Benelux and your neighbor has, a, has not a corresponding policy, it's so uh, interdependence, um, uh, it makes uh, total sense to, to have uh, a common stamp in there. So in 2018, actually, uh, a final statement within the UNFCC was, uh, was handed over. And um, this um, uh, so-called Telenoa declaration of the Benelux countries led not only to a joint statement that was handed over to the, the high level um, officer of the, of the UN um, at uh, the COP agreement in, 
in uh, Katowice, in Poland. But it also led to a Benelux pavilion. Every time now we, there is a, a, a COP reunion. Uh, the last one was in Madrid, and I think the next one is planned in Glasgow. Um, uh, we try to, uh, we, we, together with the European Investment Bank, the Benelux countries, make one Benelux uh, pavilion where uh, Benelux stakeholders can come and uh, organize events, but also, uh, let's say, if there is meetings to be facilitated with other third uh, countries, they can be facilitated in there, and it's been a, a very um, rewarding and, and, and successful, actually, uh, formula so, so far. So. Um, we we look forward to uh, to seeing that happen again. Um, topic wise and climate um, policy, there is basically uh, you can make a two uh, division in two very important areas. You know, on one hand, you have climate adaptation, which means that you adapt to already uh, have taken place climate change. Um, uh, very important for uh, countries like the Netherlands and Belgium that are partially underneath. Uh, sea level and for the whole Benelux, because we are so densely populated, uh, we need to already adapt and act now upon it. Uh, the, the, the last working group that took place on it was on uh, on water management. Um, every year we see uh, uh, well stronger extremes, uh, higher sea levels on one hand, but also longer dry periods where rivers get so little water that. The heavy boats that normally come from the Rhine all the way from Germany to uh, to um, to Rotterdam or in the other direction cannot uh, use it anymore because they are too heavy and the water is not enough to carry them. So it's very pragmatic issues, but one needs to discuss it and one needs to discuss it cross border to solve or to find solutions together to to, to nevertheless make this work. Uh, climate mitigation, on the other hand, um, where our main role. Uh, is to to make sure that, that we coordinate well the, the national plans that are being made today. Europe, the European Union has asked uh, all uh, member states, so inclusive the Benelux countries, to make their national energy and climate plans. Um, they are uh, being drawn. They have been drawn up, and we, as Benelux um, uh, office and also as hosts of the Penta um, organization, have said, "Okay, meanwhile you are writing it. We offer the, the possibility to to share these." Uh, draft plans together and we also managed to write uh, together a clause not only the Benelux countries but also the, Jura, the, the Penta countries to write a common clause um, on uh, energy and uh, climate um, uh, cooperation. Um, the leading uh, figure right now is the 55% reduction targets uh, in, in CO2 for 2030. That's a higher ambition. It used to be around 49%. Uh, and it means extra investments based on the already made uh, climate uh, plans that were put forward uh, two years ago. Um, and uh, another topic that recently was uh, was joined was the skills agenda for future green jobs. New jobs will uh, come, they will need new curricula. Uh, and whereas it is very hard to say adapt different curricula from different countries to to each other it's maybe a very good opportunity to create when new jobs are being created new curricula are being written to do this together in a benelux context um so um uh, some last other examples um while i look at, uh, at, at the clock I think I'm still uh, just in time. Some other examples, because I would like to give it some hands and feet how, let's say, concrete we work together. I mentioned uh, on the left side uh, the, the fuel stations of um, uh, hydrogen in the, in the Benelux. Um, we also um, have bordering um, areas where we have nat natural reserves um, where biodiversity is at stake with all the, for instance, the water and the dry drought problems uh, that, that are uh, at stake. In the Benelux, this is being discussed. People are being put together, uh, func not only functionaries, but experts, and we work on the solutions together. Um, we have last year um, uh, created a cooperation agreement between Benelux cities that all on their own and on their own terms had started to in, uh, introduce uh, low emission zones. Cities want to keep the air and their, their, their air clean. And of course, um, uh, that should help the health uh, of, of, of the inhabitants of those cities, but at the same time, people within this relatively small Benelux area still travel from one city to another and not only, not always know what kind of rules apply. So by making a Benelux agreement on this, 
it's going to be easier to, to drive from one city to another. Uh, and by using digital means, people don't have to uh, enroll anymore. If their car is clean enough, they can simply enter. If not, they will get uh, a notification. E-mobility, I mentioned, extremely important. The way for decarbonizing not only passenger transport, but especially um, uh, heavy load transport, so trucks, um, for the future, uh, the trucks are being developed uh, in, in high, high pace by many of the developers already, but there is no real charging infrastructure for heavy uh, transport yet. So that's something we really need to work together on. And hydrogen mobility, I have, I think, already mentioned a few times. Um, so rounding all this up, uh, where, where is potential? Where can we still work further? Because we have good relations but we still need to work uh, uh, keep ambitions high of course first of all and i think you can play a part in this pulling well-developed research and development um, uh, in in the benelux context but of course if we can get input from outside uh, that's also uh, fantastic um, facilitating um, uh, the swift development uh, repurposing of cross-border infrastructure i mentioned the, uh, if you can reuse uh, the existing gas infrastructure for future hydrogen infrastructure, it, it takes some extra investment, but that will be a much quicker and also much more uh, sustainable way uh, of doing things. And for that, you may be able to use the, the Benelux legal toolbox to already get this a kickstart in our small Benelux uh, area. Um, you can use the scale of the Benelux, small but beautiful. Uh, we have 30 million inhabitants in, in total. Uh, it's, a, it's an in interesting market to, to, to launch things in and well, of course, try to play our role and to make a substantial contribution to the EU Green Deal targets being put forward. Um, and last but not least, serving as a regulatory living lab for innovative solutions. So if something new com comes to the markets, we can be quick if the free countries decide to go forward and, uh, and create uh, legal security, because often that is the stepping stone for investment uh, to make these kind of um, innovations possible. So having said that, I thought I'd close off with a, a bit of an inspiring note with some pictures that may be recognized by you. We have already done this before, namely the sharing of knowledge between the Benelux region and Korea. And uh, I must say, you were more successful uh, than we were. And uh, me, myself, being Dutch, I can also say the Belgians were more successful than the Dutch were. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Hiddink in your country managed to uh, get you almost to, oh, you get you to the semi-finals of the, the tournament where we were not present. And I think Mr. Michel at the time managed to convince his colleagues to support him where the Dutch and the Luxembourg were not present, but the Belgians were uh, also in the semi-finals in the Russian championship. So uh, it, it works sharing knowledge and it also helps to support each other every now and then. And by this, I thank you very much for your attention and I hope uh, I can answer still some questions from your side. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Director Malama. Uh, it, it, it was truly a fantastic, uh, fantastic presentation and well, and, and the European Union it just, well, yesterday just upgraded its target for, well, to accelerate the green transition. So uh, it was great to know about uh, the Benelux Union and also energy cooperation uh, in, in, in the Benelux Union. Uh, we actually uh, we actually were supposed to have a recorded greeting uh, of, of the Belgian ambassador to Republic of Korea, but actually I found uh, the ambassador he is now in person. And so we will have a great pleasure and privilege to invite uh, Ambassador Peter Lesqui, uh, Belgian ambassador to Repub Republic of Korea for his greeting uh, remark. So uh, may I invite His Excellency Ambassador Lesqui. Yes, uh, I'm uh, here. Thank you for uh, giving me the, the floor. I'm indeed uh, Peter Lesquier. I'm the ambassador of the Kingdom of Belgium to the Republic of Korea. And I had a very busy day today. And so I knew I would not be able to be in time for the beginning of 
the lecture, so I prepared some introductory remarks that I pre-recorded to be uh, to be on the safe side. So at least you had something from me. But um, in the I came back earlier than expected, so I can could still um, take. Uh, 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 well, participate in, in part of the lecture. I'm very glad to have been given that opportunity. First, I, I must, uh, of course, uh, start by uh, uh, greeting the director of the Nordic Benelux Center, uh, the dean of the Graduate School of International Studies of the Korea University, and the, and the Jean Manet chair, the professor Lee Tiesou, for his dedication to academic exchange with Belgium. At the same to uh, token, I greet also and I thank Professor Oh Chang Ryong. I have seen him also on uh, uh, that he's participating. He's the organizer of today's seminar, I understand. And um, of course, I have to greet also Mr. Uh, Jan Molema. Uh, we are very glad that we have found an interesting speaker uh, for the Nordic Benelux Center. When in the beginning of the year we were approached by the Nordic Benelux Center asking, can can you not identify interesting speakers in the Benelux to give lectures to us? So we thought of uh, about the uh, Benelux uh, Secretariat, and I think those that are participating in this um, uh, virtual meeting will not have been disappointed, because indeed what he has been explaining is very important for the Benelux as well, but also for this region, because this region is also looking at ways to strengthen cooperation in the fields of uh, green energy, climate change, uh, and um, uh, sustainable development. Although in this region it is more difficult than in ben the Benelux, Benelux are very much like-minded countries, the same cannot be said always by the countries in this region here in uh, Northeast Asia. But I think, Mr. Moloma, that your lecture will certainly give food for thought and may provide inspiration. And I, I think that uh, we have seen a very, uh, very good examples of how the Union of Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, so the Benelux, has been a laboratory for regional cooperation, and has been leading by examples, and has been a stimulus to wider European integration. And so also in the uh, newer field of climate change, climate change being the most daunting challenge of the 21st century, and even the largest states will have to cooperate in order to turn the tide. So certainly for small countries like uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, that's even more uh, the case. Just a general word of this, uh, about this uh, uh, online lecture series, because they are part of a series. It's not uh, one lecture only. Those uh, series draw now to a close. And um, it gives me the opportunity to stress the importance of partnerships between Belgian and Korean universities. And so I have already decided that this initiative, which was originally meant as a way to mark the 120 years of bilateral diplomatic relation between Belgium and Korea, will be continued in the coming years. Now, aside from uh, academic events, we also organize um, uh, cultural events uh, for, to mark this, uh, well, to, to celebrate and mark the fact that Belgium and Korea signed their first bilateral treaty in 1901. And so if you want to stay up to date on events that will be organized in the coming months, you can visit our website, it's called koreabelgium120.com. You can visit our website regularly. So I, to conclude, I hope that the participants have uh, had a inspiring and memorable lecture. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Well, certainly, uh, well, so I, once again, I congratulate uh, 110th uh, anniversary uh, of our uh, relationships. And also, uh, 
Well, it was a great event, the lecture series in, in, in a number of Korean universities. And, and I think uh, it, it, it actually opened another chapter of the, uh, of the educational and, and, and well, and also the, uh, the, the, the re at the researcher level. Well, that, that was a great opportunity well, and provide a, a template for further collaboration and cooperation. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear that this kind of, of lecture series uh, will be continued in the future. And I will be more than happy to participate and support this lecture on behalf of, of Korea University and on behalf of uh, Nordic Banner Center. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, why don't we uh, go back to the lecture? Uh, we have roughly a 20 uh, minute left for our, our scheduled meeting. And, and uh, we, we, well, we have uh, far more than, well, we actually had, had far more than 40, 40 student and participant joining. So uh, I may, well, well, using the, uh, taking advantage of, of, the, uh, of, of the moderator's privilege, I, I may make uh, one question uh, and, and comment first, and then I will open the floor uh, to, uh, to give uh, the student and researchers from Korea University side to, um, to ask question uh, to Professor Malama. Okay, so uh, it, it was truly inspiring uh, to see what Benerick's union what, what has been doing. And one uh, big reason uh, of establishing and working in, in the Nordic Benerick Center is actually to enhance uh, research, well, research cooperation and education cooperation with, with those uh, countries and and the high, or the high ranking universities in, in in those regions. So it was very nice to see that well, this Banerjee Union is uh, is not only a highly dense, well, densely populated area, but also then well, it's a dense network of very high ranking educational institutions. So uh, my, the first question, my question was a general question, uh, would be uh, in case, in, in the area of, of sustainable development, for example, uh, what kind of education and R&D projects are going on in, in the Banerjee Union? and how that could be linked to the other parts of the world, especially including South, uh, Republic of Korea. So we have brilliant scholars and young students aspiring to, to build their career, to study and, and continue doing, doing postdoc or, or doctoral research there. So I'm, I'm curious about, as an educator, I'm, I'm curious about that fact. And uh, my second question is actually, I myself am a researcher of energy security and, and energy policy. So I, I've, been, I've been looking at uh, this kind of the, the European Green Deal and other energy the, the security agenda in, in the North Sea and, and other parts. And, and uh, suddenly I, I can see that the, the North Sea, uh, North Sea is turning into to oil and gas producing area into a huge green sea with, with, with wind farms and, uh, and, and renewable energy sources. And, uh, but to facilitate this kind of regional cooperation, uh, there should be certain, well, there should be a, a number of different enabling factors. And if I, well, I just took a, a several like keyword on my note, well, pricing can be one thing, infrastructure would be another, regulatory agencies, including legal harmonization would be important, governance and leadership, we cannot highlight too much, and also the R&D technology and, and the training uh, new like engineers and, and researchers. So among this enabling factor, if you have to choose one or two priorities for this kind of 
a regional level cooperation, what kind of issue uh, you would highlight and, uh, and, with, and also the factors that could be uh, exported, transplanted in other parts of the world. In, in Northeast Asia, we are actually discussing a very similar scheme uh, agenda. So uh, that would be my two questions. Okay, uh, and, and quite, uh, let's say, uh, broad and uh, far, far going questions. Um, uh, it's always tempting to, to, to choose uh, the favorite topics, but uh, to, to start with the, 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 the last question, uh, Professor, the, uh, what are uh, key enabling factors? I, I would pick two, uh, starting with um, uh, creating a regulatory um, environment in which um, innovation is possible, uh, which is not easy because I said um, much of the activity taking place uh, on the North Sea today uh, was not foreseen by any legislation uh, that was made for uh, exploiting uh, the, the North Sea uh, as it was uh, years ago, as you clearly mentioned also for it was much focused on um, uh, let's say oil drilling, it was focused on uh, gas uh, transportation. Um, this is a, a different scenario. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's also a scenario in which you have to uh, weigh different um, uh, factors and different uh, interests from many parties. Parties to give a very simple example: if you build uh, or if you plan a, um, a wind farm on the North Sea. You do not only have to find the right location where you can place the pillars and have the right wind, but you also need to be aware of the fact that fishermen are uh, fishing in that area and having their daily living there and uh, uh, people are depending on that uh, to, to get the fish from there. Um, uh, there are quite large chunks of the North Sea actually being predestined as um, natural reserves. You cannot simply start building in there. Uh, there needs to be a balance in there. It doesn't need to be necessarily bad, by the way, for, um, for, for, uh, from the environmental impacts of view, but it needs to be planned and it needs to be in, in well um, concordation. Um, so on one hand, creates the, the, the legal uh, environment in which um, those things are being well and correctly being weighed. And at the same time, very important, it becomes secure and clear in what you invest because one of the biggest problems in the beginning was to attract investors. The lead times were very long, the risks were quite high, and the return on investment was not yeah, so obvious, uh, especially not competitive yet at that time to, um, to, to invest in fossil fuels. So I think the, 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 the regulatory part is really, really important. Uh, and you, you gave a little bit the hint to yourself, political leadership probably in the end makes uh, the decisive step uh, if and i think by yesterday's decision on uh, uh, agreeing upon the climate law uh, in, in the european union between the the ministers and council and the european parliament a, a big step has been set and um, the targets are very clear right now that the, the reduction targets on co2 we will not be able to do this in the european union without making a, a good and working uh, situation uh, on the North Sea. So this even means that, um, uh, let's say, the, uh, as difficult as they are, uh, discussions with uh, the, all parties around the, the, the North Seas need to be put and done in a well, um, a correct order. Uh, and all uh, political leaders um, uh, need to show leadership in this. And then you had a first question on, um, um, the, uh, let's say the academic point of view uh, and, and the cooperation across border of this. Maybe it's, it's, it's good to give as a, as a background story. The, the Benelux Union uh, two or three years ago also has made a um, quite a uh, forward or a pioneering uh, decision on um, uh, recognizing all academic uh, diplomas within the Benelux, uh, regardless from which the country they are, they recognize the, the level of it. So if you got your degree in the Netherlands, you can use it immediately without translation um, in uh, Belgium or in Luxembourg and vice versa. Um, and this has been a European 
ambition for a long time. It's, I think, the Florence Agreement that was called, but it was never really realized. Uh, we gave it hands and feet and made it possible right now. It's been so inspiring that right now the Baltic countries, so the, the, the Estonia, Lettland, uh, Lithuania, are copying this and, and are making uh, basically <clears throat> an agreement amongst them each other uh, and try to link this to the Benelux Agreement. So uh, within the Benelux, exchange on an academic level is being facilitated in a, in, in a uh, intensive way and <coughs> pardon, on the, the, the level of um, or in the, in the field of uh, energy uh, I mentioned the, uh, the the Benelux energy expertise network there's many universities actually also participating there either directly or through platforms and you see the role of universities technical universities but also legal universities um, uh, they're, it's, 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 it's quite substantial. They are important facilitators of the energy transition. Um, uh, I, I think that answers your question up to a certain level. If we need to go a little bit further. I'm happy to speak to you on a bilateral level on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maluma. Now I will open the floor. Um, uh, for the participant, uh, you can actually use the, the Zoom function. You can uh, raise your hand function. So uh, otherwise you can turn on your uh, video and, and audio uh, to, to pop up, to show up and, and raise the question. So now floor is open. So you can either uh, raise your hand, uh, the Zoom setting, or just, just send some cup of hot there. Oh, uh, Park Seong. Okay, so first floor is yours. Um, you hello, go? can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you oh, so would you, much. Would you, would you introduce yourself first? Oh, sorry, my bad. Um, uh, my name is Seyoung, and I'm currently studying environmental science at Korea University, and I'm an undergraduate. So. Mm. Thank you so much for the lecture. I found it very interesting. And um, I didn't know that there were so many um, uh, regional efforts in uh, in the Benelux. And I was wondering, because I read this um, article that saying that um, the Netherlands is, most of Netherlands is below sea level. So they have a very difficult time they would have a very difficult time if the sea level were to rise above a certain, just a bit. And they were already thinking of various methods to um, adapt to this, this new climate. And so I was wondering, because this uh, area as, as a regional, effect, uh, as a regional um, effort did anything or try anything to to solve this problem that's just not um netherlands problem itself um would you have any ideas or any um anything that you can share with me i was just curious okay uh why don't we uh proceed this way uh since the time since time is limited uh so why don't we collect a couple of questions, if possible, maybe two or three, and, and give uh, the floor to Dr. Malama to, to answer those questions. Uh, is there any second question? Uh, yes, uh, Suji? Yeah, um, thank you, Professor Malama, for a very useful lecture and for sharing the best practice of vitalizing regional cooperation in energy and climate policy. Uh, my name is Yuji. I'm working for the World Energy Council as a regional manager of Asia. And I'm also a student of graduate school of energy and environment at the Korea University. I completely agree with your comment in the beginning that regional cooperation should be built not only from top down, top down way, but it, it should be more inclusive. Um, and this is also very important vision we draw in a context of humanizing energy, which became key vision among many international organizations these days. But in reality, it's really not easy, especially in Asia, with the very bureaucratic culture and most of initiatives are led by government and corporates, 
So I would like to know, uh, what do you think in your perspective, it would be the biggest challenge in building energy experts network and bringing regional cooperation in more inclusive way? And how can we cope with the challenges for more successful bottom up cooperation for energy transition? Thank you. Okay, that was another wonderful question. Uh, may I uh, get just one more question and go back to uh, Dr. Molomer? Anyone raising hand? Okay, uh, Dr. Lee, uh, Tony Hungu Lee. Yeah, um, my name is Tony. I just got a, a PhD in the energy, energy, energy and policy, uh, environmental policy. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation and appreciate for the uh, this special lecture by the Nordic Energy Center. Uh, my question is actually the uh, we all know about the uh, European countries have still heavily relied on the Russian uh, Russia gas for the, the winter. In terms of the uh, energy cooperation and security, and considering about geopolitical location of the Benelux countries between Eastern and uh, Western uh, Western Europe. How do you think and your perspective about the Nord Stream 2? It should be continued to connect. Is the uh, Biden administration in the United States actions for the Nord Stream 2 reasonable? Yeah, that's it. Okay, uh, Dr. Lee, you, you just touched upon the most sensitive uh, agenda in, in, um, in, in the Northern uh, European side, well, it's, it's actually between Russia and Germany, but I hope uh, Dr. Malama could also uh, show some uh, insight from the Nordic, well, from the Benelux perspective. So we have three sets of questions. Now uh, the floor is uh, again to you, Mr. Malama. Yes, and uh, I may, may have to ask your uh, your support here, um, uh, Professor, because the, the last question, I had some acoustic problems here. Maybe uh, you could re rephrase it briefly for me. Yes, I, I, yeah. would, be I, I would be happy to uh, rephrase. Uh, last question was actually about uh, the gas pipeline uh, between Russia and Germany, Nord Stream 2. So, and, and the United States are, are quite negative, well, has been sanctioning that uh, gas pipeline. Well, renewable energies are important, but actually the gas is quite crucial. So, uh, if it, well, it, even though it, it will be a Russo-German uh, pipeline issue, but the entire European Union it, uh, is also involved. So, uh, what would be your perspective? Uh, and, and your observation on, on the future of Nord Stream 2, that, uh, that was the third question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for rephrasing it. Uh, and, and it was a beautiful background, by the way, with uh, I think the biggest library of, uh, of, uh, of soul in, in the background. Um, and and, it's, and let me underline, it's good to be involved and to think about these questions because uh, as one of the other uh, persons asking the questions uh, also said, uh, the bottom of the, the importance of energy in our everyday lives is so important. In the end, it's important for democracy. You know, let's, let's, let's put it like this. Uh, as, a, as a functionary of the, the Benelux Union, I will not give any, let's say, clear statements on what is good or bad about this pipeline. I can only say that um, these interconnections between, uh, let's say, uh, the, the um, uh, let's say importance providers of, 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 uh, of energy today and the, uh, let's say the, the users, the, the big economies using this, they are of course very crucial to stability. And so we have to be very careful with these kind of discussions and these kind of discussions are, uh, let's say from my point of view, always something that uh, um, take place at a, at a much higher level, uh, definitely not my level, but the European Union looks at this with very much care. Um, and as we are trying to help Europe with the, uh, let's say, the reaching uh, or the giving our contributions to, to, to reaching the Green Deal, uh, I trust that Europe will take wise decisions in, in negotiating this. And for sure, I think that has already happened. 
the that was also the last part of the question which i got well the the european union has taken up very good uh, starting relations with the the biden administration i even heard something on the news today where uh, in, uh, in the german news uh, there was a suggestion made that we should make a, some sort of a pact between the european union and the, the american uh, climate change uh, ambitions that are both very very high and very very well funded uh, so I think all intentions are there to organize this in a in a, in a very um, uh, let's say correct and especially in the end climate um, uh, fostering way. So let that be my diplomatic answer to the to the last important question. But you can understand uh, the, the way I have to uh, to answer this one. Then um, the uh, first question on um, uh, let's say a little bit more on the. Uh, the, the the northern part of the Benelux, uh, not only the northern part, by the way, but the the, the, the fact that parts of the Benelux are below sea level. Um, what can you do about that? And what can you uh, actually uh, can you use regional cooperation? Cooperation in this. Well, I try, I try to mention it a little bit. This is what we call. Um, what can we already do today in the field of climate adaptation? Uh, the, the the Benelux countries are known as engineers in waterworks. Yeah. Uh, and where we in the past have built dikes and sells those this, this knowledge all over the world and, and share this knowledge all over the world, how to deal with, uh, let's say, storms and, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, expected high tides every now and then. We now are in a situation where <laughs> we have to help ourselves on this a little bit. Uh, but let me assure you, this has not, not been on the agenda just for the last two, three years. This, this has been always on the, on, on, uh, the agenda. Um, and it's, um, it's uh, by the way, it's not only the high sea levels from one side, it's also the, uh, let's say, the more irregular flows of water coming from uh, the big rivers that uh, partially end up in, uh, in the Benelux countries and uh, also affects the tide in, for instance, a, a harbor like um, uh, Anvers is uh, only reachable a part of the day because it, it goes with the, the tides of the sea. Um, so what has been do, done in that, for instance, in the, the big river area uh, in, in the Netherlands the last couple of years, it's, it's been a, a really big exercise, but the, the water flows of the rivers have been giving uh, back space uh, like it was in the past, where in, uh, let's say, the 50s and 60s, we were just hiring dikes to keep the water in and keep it, get it as fast as we could to the sea. We now basically create big areas around the rivers where when the water gets too high, it can flow out into. And at the same time, we use this to uh, revive nature and to create a little bit of tourism around it. So there's lots of, it's, it's a rethinking process, but with lots of win-win-wins around it. So that's maybe a nice, uh, nice uh, example. And then I have to uh, catch back the second question of Su Lee. Uh, which I think was um, much about um, just transition. How do you make sure? She, she uh, rephrased me in my um, first uh, lines on um, that the, the, the process must, if, if possible, also be, be, be bottom up. Huh? Uh, she's right. In many uh, situations, in many, uh, for many years, it has been a very much a top down decision. We need an energy, so we build a factory, and it will be done by that and that company, and full stop. Uh, I think the energy transition of today, and that's being um, re repeated over and over again, actually, by our uh, Dutch energy uh, uh, EU commissioner, Mr. Timmermans, uh, it must be a just transition, or otherwise there will just be no transition. Um, Energy transition is an investment. It costs money. It costs money not only for companies to adapt, it costs money for the normal civilian to uh, isolate their houses at maybe a time in their life where they don't have budgets for doing this. What a very nice example what's, uh, what is being proposed um, uh, right now for isolation of, uh, of, of private buildings is that people can, uh, in agreement with their bank, take loans that is basically being um, uh, funded at that time uh, through um, uh, states, um, uh, con uh, state, states construction and uh, can be paid back by the, um, uh, let's say, the lower energy bill over the years to come. So uh, the, the net effects on your current uh, uh, expenses is zero. 
uh, you just need to make a plan on how to invest now and pay over time back with the lower energy bills that you get from an isolated house uh, over, the, over the coming years. Uh, but of course, you need to create structures and again, regulatory security over this. Uh, but I'm completely agreeing with Sylvie. Agreeing with, uh, we need to think about all um, players in this, and especially, and we've seen this with the whole um, movement uh, being initiated by um, uh, Friday for Futures uh, by uh, famous Greta Thunberg. Um, everybody uh, that can do a participation should be given the possibility to do, to do this uh, participation. If you feel like uh, putting solar screens on the roof of your house, then let's try and make this possible and uh, take away all the legal hurdles that are there um, and maybe financial hurdles. Uh, all players can play a role in this, banks can play a role in this, companies can play a role in this. Uh, you yourself as university academics can play a role in this. It's something we have to do together. We're in this together, as they uh, say. I hope this answers your question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Malama. Indeed, uh, the, this energy transition issues uh, need need, uh, need multiple dimension, multiple dimensional approach. Well, it can be from engineering side and uh, and also social science side, legal side, economic side. So, well, that, that is, is is a big agenda. And also in terms of the the connectivity. Uh, the, the spirit of the European Union, I, I think uh, these kind of issues uh, will be uh, will be continued uh, to be discussed in, in, in the Asia Europe meetings and, and other uh, kind of connectivity uh, setting. So uh, well to well to, to add up just one one uh, like is this near the conclu well, conclusionary uh, remark, but uh, Korea University is also uh, running a John Money Center of, of Excellence and John Money Network Project, on, especially on, on the connectivity uh, agenda between the European Union and Korea. So you know, also in, in that sense, I think uh, we will, Korea University will have some more work to work with the Benelux Union and also, we will be very uh, happy to uh, invite you again to, to another webinar, if possible, offline, and, and also vice versa. We will be happy to visit the, the Benelux uh, Union at some point. And I, and I will do my best to introduce uh, and, and, and uh, let the Korea University student and, and researchers know about Benelux Union and visit their homepage and, and, and pick up more information from there. And uh, Nordic Benelux Center's uh, Innovation Factory uh, started, well, the, the spring season started with, with the, the Benelux Union. And our next, uh, next special lecture is actually uh, on, on the famous IT company ASML, uh, also for, from Netherlands. So the CEO of, of ASML, uh, Korea uh, will be uh, will be actually off and online at, at Korea University. So don't uh, we will send out the uh, the, un the announcement uh, pretty soon. So don't forget uh, that event. Well, that event is on on the twelfth of May, just roughly three weeks from now. Okay. So uh, I I'm I'm sure that we have tons of questions. Uh, but I also know that this is a time to let uh, uh, to conclude this session. So we are left. Well, we, we have many stone on 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 turn, but I sincerely hope uh, we will have next chance to follow each other. And and uh, once again, I'm very thankful to Mr. Malama for his wonderful lecture and very. Uh, insightful Q and A. So why don't we uh, give warm round of applause to uh, Doctor uh, to to Director Malama? Thank you. Can can I say one last uh, thinking word to you as well? Definitely. Last word is on you. 
Yes. No, thanks once again. And uh, from the bottom of my heart, I, I, I believe in exchange and uh, I have, as a student, had the pleasure to have been uh, uh, benefiting of um, uh, visiting uh, various uh, universities. So I would only enhance these, uh, this Nordic Benelux uh, cooperation with uh, the Korean University uh, and hopefully in the future with physical uh, exchange, because that in the end um, uh, is, is something changing lives uh, in, in a very positive way, I think. Um, if at some point in time you will have Professor and your colleagues, um, uh, Mr. Um, oh, and uh, the Lee, who have prepared it so well, the possibility to come to uh, the Benelux, I would warmly welcome you to come and visit the Benelux house. It's at a beautiful location in the heart of uh, Brussels, uh, close to the best chocolate square of the whole city, so feel free. Um, and uh, I would virtually hand over to you the little Benelux flag, which I hope one day lands on your beautifully uh, organized desk, uh, de desk in the background, so which uh, deserves a nice little uh, flag like this. So I, I will see if I will send it to you or if I will see, give it to you the next time you are in Brussels. Thank you very much and hope to see you uh, in the near future. And good luck with ASML, fantastic company uh, uh, lecture in, uh, in, in May. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your participation and, 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 and thank you for your sincere attention. So now I will wrap up uh, the session. Hope to see you again in the next Nordic Benelux Innovation Factory. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.